Welcome to Medical Moral. This lecture is Personhood is Ground Zero. In this medical ethics course, we're going to try to determine what or who is the human person. So we'll ask the question, when am I? Or even more specifically, who am I? What we're saying is that ethics begins with being. This is typically the study of ontology, what a thing is. Here's a way to really make my point clear. If um, behind a wall um, there is a box and you cannot see this box, but I tell you that there is something living within that box, and I ask your permission if I can go over there and step on it and destroy whatever is living within that box, I'm hoping that the very first thing you would ask is, what is it? Um, we're trying to determine what is this being. You know, if I tell you, well, it's just a cockroach within that box. Now, you know, maybe you wouldn't like to kill something for no reason, but typically a person would have no issue with killing a cockroach. If I were to tell you it's a rabbit, you would not see any warrant for doing such a thing. Um, if I were to tell you it's a chimpanzee or a baby, you know, you can almost see the um, level of hierarchy of being. Um, start to raise our ire for why would you even consider doing this. But either way, what we're determining there is we're trying to say what is that thing before we can make any sort of, uh, say, ethical evaluation on it. Now, we make that ethical evaluation based on the value that we place on that being. So we place a higher value on the human than we would even the rabbit, and we place a higher value on the rabbit than we would the cockroach. So that's how we work through something like this. But with the human person, we have a few terms that need to be uh, distinguished from each other. And also, by distinguishing those, it'll help us understand, uh, you know, how we will apply the ethics in the various, you know, cases that we're going to be looking at here in the future. The three terms that I want to look at are life, human, and personhood. Uh, we'll look at life first. Now, this is a biological term. It's not a philosophical or even a theological term. What is or is not alive has to be determined by some empirical means through the life sciences. So we would maybe ask, what exactly would be the qualities of a thing that is, uh, that is alive? Now, this isn't a definitive list, but we would be able to say that this being has some capacity for growth. You know, it responds to stimuli. Uh, perhaps it has the ability to metabolize uh, homeostasis, of course, and reproduction. Now, those things, something that possesses those qualities, we would consider alive, and then that would be distinct from something that is either dead or inert, like, you know, like a vapor or a rock or such. Now, there may be some uh, questions as to exactly what is the value or the qualities that are on that list. Uh, perhaps, is a virus alive? Well, many would say no. But what we're going to have to try to at least determine in the, how we're applying the ethics here is that there may be some things that we don't know or are not certain of, but those don't trump the things that we are certain of. We know what is alive and not alive. So if we're questioning whether or not the being is alive, that's different than just simply saying that it is alive. Another term that um, is simply a biological term is human. So this is a classification of you know what we would call the homo sapiens. It, it has we have the ability you know, to walk upright, we develop tools, there's brain capacity, the development of language, uh, capacity for social interaction, risibility, uh, consciousness, all kinds of things that we will look at to say that these typically are classifications that we use to determine what is or is not of the hominin lineage. Now, it could be that in the beginning of this lineage, in other words, well, I shouldn't say in the beginning of this lineage, but where we see maybe a transition from Neanderthal to Homo sapien, maybe we're not exactly clear scientifically um, where we can actually um, demarcate and say that this is human. But that's not really a concern for us. In, in our view, we are not confused in the present day what is or is not human. If we went to a zoo, we would be very clear what is a chimpanzee or an orangutan and what is a human. So my point is this with these before I move on. In issues that involved, uh, say, um, abortion or euthanasia, um, stem cell research, cloning, these types of things, we're trying to figure out what is the values that we place on these things and how do we determine, you know, what this thing is. When, when 
we get into arguments over, say, the pro-life, where a person would be opposed to abortion, or the pro-choice, where a person would want a woman to have the right to choose, um, the distinctions that aren't typically made in the pedestrian way, and by that I mean just a normal conversation, is it's never about life or about the humanness of what we're talking about. That doesn't defeat or um, complete one person's argument, and it doesn't defeat the others. So if a person who believes that a woman has the right to choose were to concede that life begins at conception, that does not defeat them and then obviously make them hold the pro-life position. And I've already spoken to you how I find these, uh, these, low, these slogans uh, pr- problematic. So the sperm and the egg are alive, and obviously the embryo is alive. It doesn't die in between. So this is, this is lo- alive. And it's also human. I mean, it, it's not going to be something else. An embryo is not going to be a giraffe, and it's not going to be a, um, a rabbit. So these things should be set aside. These are not those things that we argue about. These are biological classifications that were settled on, and they don't end the discussion with abortion or euthanasia or anything like that. Now, this lecture is not about those things, but I'm using those things which are very clear to explain my position on this. What the argument should be about, we'll get to in a minute. I want to bring one more thing up about this concept of human and how we classify it. It's a scientific truth that we share up to 99% of the DNA of a chimpanzee. Now, it's, that's remarkable, to be honest. But oftentimes people will mean by that that somehow we are 99% like a chimpanzee. Now, there's a few problems with that. Um, one problem is it's very reductionist. In other words, it makes the human person nothing more than the sum of their DNA. Um, that's not a good understanding of the human person. But it also misrepresents the, the statistic. Just because 99% of the DNA is shared doesn't mean that then the comparison could say we're 99% like um, the chimpanzee. There are tens of thousands of structural changes that result from that 1% difference. Now, I'm not going to spend any time trying to explain that any further, but if you want a very easy way to try to um, grasp why those structural changes are so significant, that 1% and those tens of thousands of structural changes account for all civilization. You know, as opposed to any um, being in the animal kingdom besides the human, um, the human person with that 1% distinction accounts for the Sistine Chapel, um, Led Zeppelin, um, football, just pick anything. Um, it, you know, the engineering capacity to build bridges and um, y- you name it. Um, CRISPR technologies. Uh, we can actually, you know, go in and try to perhaps and enhance in, uh, our own DNA. So it's pretty significant. But it's also, again, a, a reductionist view of the human person. So we're going to leave you know, the terms life and human aside. Those are not going to be things that we will um, have to bring to bear. Everything in the medical moral ethic field we're talking about, they are um, both alive and they are human. So we're going to try now to give some sort of um, grasping of this idea of humans and persons. In other words, are all human life persons, or are there some um, human lives that are not persons? Basically, what we're going to be asking is, what makes you you? So let's just pick a name. We'll, we'll say Julie. And we're going to walk through a series of questions here. Was Julie ever a sperm or an egg separately? Was Julie ever a two-week-old fetus? Now, as we walk through this, what I want you to pay particular attention to is, are there things there that you are saying yes to, and what are those things that you're saying no to? And of the things that you said yes to, what are the similarities between them? Because that's the criteria that you have in your mind for what constitutes personhood, what constitutes Julie from just a a living human. And the things that you would say no to, what makes those things distinct from what you consider um, Julie, not just a uh, living human, but also a person. Was Julie ever a six-month-old fetus? Was Julie a two-month-old infant? Was Julie a 10-year-old child and a 17-year-old adolescent? 
Would Julie still exist if she fell into a permanent vegetative state? Now, you know, you could start almost thinking here in terms of a permanent vegetative state if there's a tragedy in your family and an uncle or a grandparent um, were comatose, was there a time when you started saying, that's not them, they're no longer here? Whatever it is that you're saying they are no longer here is starting to form your views of personhood. And the goal through all of this is for us to be intellectually and therefore ethically consistent so that we can come up with some sort of um, understanding of what makes an individual person and then apply that across the board. So, this Julie, would she still be her if she had some you know, personality-altering uh, permanent brain injury? Because uh, sometimes people have brain injuries and they almost take on a, an entirely different um, persona. Um, they become, become very agitated and angry and, and such, and we might say that's no longer them, or they're different. But see, we, we find ways to try to speak about it. Would you be you if your heart and lung function was permanently replaced by machines? How about Julie after she's dead for 30 seconds? Is she no longer Julie? Or um, maybe it's a little easier for us to comprehend when we're dusty remains in a coffin. We probably would be okay um, saying it's still that person when they um, lose both legs. We might talk that they are different, but we would certainly still call them them. Um, um, would you still be you upon losing all your limbs? How about if you lost your body and only the head and a brain were kept alive artificially? In other words, you know, one of these scientific experiments where you have, say, the, the brain and the vat, um, is that you? Are all those memories and all the personalities, are they all part of the firing synapses that exist within the, the mind or the brain? How about if each of our organs were replaced one at a time over a period of a few years? You know, so um, you can almost imagine like a ship that uh, started out, you know, with all brand new materials, and over the course of, say, 50 years, every board, every bolt, every uh, mast, every sail, we were all changed. So that after 50 years, there's not one original piece whatsoever. Um, is it new? Or is it the, what makes it continuous um, throughout those 50 years? Uh, we're we're going to look more at that particular little situation uh, next class. How about if the whole torso and head were replaced with artificial parts? How about if you had really um, advanced Alzheimer's and you had no recollection of your youth? Are you still the identical person you were when you were younger? And you could see the applications of what we're trying to get at here. How about if all your moral values are replaced with the opposite moral values? If a person had a way to go in there and through some sort of chemical manipulation to uh, give you, like, say, an alter ego, would that still be you? Or we, we start saying that's not really them. What if we make a duplicate brain and that contains all the memories, the psychology, all the personality and such, and we put the duplicate brain in another person. In other words, we take your, let's do a swap. We take your brain and put it in somebody else's body and put their brain in your body. Um, which one's you? Which one's Julie? What if we just, oh, here we go. If we move our brain into another body and it continues to function in another body, where did you go? Is that still you? Are you in that body or do you remain no longer? Is that something entirely different? So these are just things for you to start considering that, you know, we have to try to determine that if we have these biological categories of life in human, where are we going to come up with an idea of what constitutes a person? And the reason why this is so important, because when we talk about issues about um, concerning abortion and euthanasia, stem cell research, cloning, all those things, the idea of personhood is really where the discussion needs to be. It's just rarely there. Um, so this is why we seem to make not much progress, because everybody's caught up arguing, you know, um, are you pro-life? Well, you're not pro-death. Well, you're pro-choice. Well, pro-choice for what? Um, we have to get down to the idea of what is our concept of personhood and how will we apply that um, ethically consistently um, across the, our entire spectrum of our ethical pursuits. So when we're trying to figure out and you know what constitutes personhood, you could probably have fathomed from that list that we went through that you were trying to determine some capacity, you know, whatever that might be, uh, consciousness, uh, memories, uh, the sense of pain, um, the ability of just to, um, to recognize oneself, an awareness, whatever it might be. You know, there was some capacity X that we're going to say, or at least somebody might say, this constitutes a person. Without that capacity, you're not a person. Uh, so 
perhaps maybe you said, well, um, I'm okay with considering the individual a person provided that they just simply forgot because of some injury what they were when they were younger. But if they were entirely different, then maybe not so. If there was some brain-altering um, uh, problem that made them an entirely different individual and we don't even recognize that person and they themselves have total um, loss of amnesia, so not loss of amnesia, but they have amnesia, loss of memories, so therefore they no longer have that capacity. Uh, we could talk in terms of potentiality too. Sometimes somebody might say, well, you know, if memory is important, uh, a two-year-old's not going to have memories per se that they will be able to use and say, well, you know, that's important. But don't they have the potential to have the experiences and everything else? You know, we would say that life should not be taken away from them um, because they have the potential to have all these things that uh, we as adults share. So these are some of the struggles. Now, we're not doing this from a dogmatic point of view. If we were, and this is not just Roman Catholic, and it's not just Christian, because there are um, plenty of uh, non-theistic philosophers and, and such that would hold that the human individual has a nature. So we would say a human nature. Now, natures are stable things. They're the thing by which we know something. So if we were to talk about an apple, um, the, the apples can have a certain nature to it. And it's not just the shape and the form and such, but it's going to include those, right? I mean, we would be a little confused if we saw an apple that was shaped like a banana. Or we would saw a giraffe, perhaps, uh, you know, shaped like a, a seal. Those things wouldn't quite make sense for us. Or even to say that, you know, what we would consider, say, the nature of a hyena, how it hunts and everything else. If we saw the hyena act more, um, I don't know, like a rabbit, we would think that there's something about its nature that is no longer there. So the nature is this substance underneath the thing by which we know it. In at least Roman Catholic theology, based on natural law, we would say there is a nature to a thing. But that brings up some questions, um, and I made a little chart, hopefully, to try to understand the distinction between saying something that you may have heard the term act and potency, or actuality and potentiality. In ethics, especially, you'll hear someone speak about, um, okay, so the baby is unborn. It's, uh, you know, say, um, a, I don't know, a, a six-month uh, fetus. It only has the potentially, the potentiality, I'm sorry, to be human. Well, that wouldn't be quite right because we said those are biological classifications. This is already human, and it's already alive. So we're going to push those to the side. But somebody might say it has the potentiality for um, whatever capacity it is that they think is a determination for that particular personhood classification. Personhood, when we're talking in terms of um, potentiality, is not just something in the future. So sometimes we hear potentiality and what we really think it means is a possibility. So the difference here is there is no other possibilities. If I were to um, stand in front of you and hold, say, a pen, you know, uh, you know, straight out in front of me, and I would ask you if I let go of this pen, what is the potentiality? Um, and you would say what's going to fall and hit the ground. That is its only potentiality. So if we, if we want to try to say, are there other possible scenarios? No. If I were to release it, the pen would not float in midair and it wouldn't fly up in the air. So when we talk in terms of potentiality, it, that is the only direction it can go. In terms of, say, an acorn, if we held an acorn, we would talk about its act or its actuality of the acorn. Now, as simple as that sounds, just hang on a second. Is there a potentiality within the acorn? There is. This acorn could, um, if all things uh, go its way, turn into a sapling. And then we would call that sapling actual. So the potential acorn became an actual sapling. And now the actual sapling possesses the potentiality to be a tree. And once that acorn, if nothing you know, um, stops it from continuing on in its only possibility or potentiality, it will be the actual tree. So that nature is always within the acorn, the sapling, and the tree. And by comparison and analogy, the fetus is not... a a potential anything else other than a toddler. At the moment, it's the actual fetus. When it does become a toddler, that's its actuality. It still has the potentiality to be an adult. And when it's adult, that becomes its actuality. There is no other possibility. 
It's not going to become something else. So what we then say is that each of these had an essence or a nature. It means the same thing here. The acorn, the sapling, and the tree always possessed the essence as oak. And we will say, you know, the fetus, the toddler, and the doll always possess this essence as a human. All right? Now, that may not be in, entirely controversial to you. You might still start to think, well, but is this human a person? Well, that's the last thing we at least have to address, even if we're not going to necessarily settle it here, settle it in your mind. Now, this is a little phrase odd. Um, instead of such a thing as a non-human person, it should read, is there such a thing as a human life that's not a person? In other words, if human and life are biological concepts, and it's relatively uncontroversial to say that that happens at the moment of fertilization, then when does this become a person? If it doesn't become a person at the same time that it is a human life, then at some point along the path, we would have to consider this to be a non-person human life. And that's going to go back to somebody thinking about what the capacities um, might be and what their identification from the list that we went through on those three slides as to what may or may not constitute personhood. Now, something to consider here is that when something is dehumanized, that will typically always result in genocide. So in the Rwanda genocide, the Tutsis were considered cockroaches. In other words, they weren't even considered to be humans. So that was more than depersonalization. That was obviously dehumanization. So genocides are always built on this. Um, think of how uh, perhaps... Uh, how, say, in um, sex slavery or, you know, child abduction for um, these nefarious um, and, and terrible ends, it, the individual almost has to not consider them human because the minute that you humanize something, it, it tends to start working on our um, ethics, if you want to say, and if we have any sort of conscience, it starts to be brought into bear on that. Uh, you can almost imagine in some sort of uh, situation where a person is held captive, um, they may tend not to speak about this individual in human terms, even objectifying them by referring to them as it. You know, that way they can, in their mind, clear their way, um, their conscience, at least help them to dehumanize the individual. And not considering them humans, then, will, you know, place them in another category that they don't feel like they're um, having an ethical conflict. Depersonalization would be okay, we accept them being human, and they are alive, but we're not, they are not persons. So something for you to consider in this is when do they become persons, and what has happened in the past when other individuals have thought that they are persons, but others are not? You know, what, I guess the, the basic question is, who decides this? You know, now, we may use other metrics to try to determine, you know, what constitutes a human person in the state of a fetus. But we're still trying to make a determination. So let me say up front that, you know, in that particular debate, one ethicist, uh, Peter Singer from Princeton University, talks about the one quality that's absolutely necessary for personhood is self-awareness or consciousness. In other words, that you realize that you are separate than the world. That typically um, comes around five or six months of age post-uterine. So we're talking, you know, after birth. Now, that means up until that point, he, he, not only is he okay with abortion, he's okay with ending the human life up to that point because they are not persons yet. So for an individual that holds a non-person status for the unborn, he just continues that through the fifth or sixth month. Now, that's appalling to many people, but I should at least, you know, state that he's ethically consistent and it's very clear. Uh, typically, no philosophers think that somehow just because the individual is outside the womb that that becomes a person, that it happens somewhere else. Uh, you might have heard arguments about viability around 24, 22 weeks. Um, people argue heartbeat, pain stimuli, all these things. But the overarching goal here, and, and I really didn't want to make this about the abortion issue. It's just that that's part of, you know, like we would say, the result of whatever we decide 
would or not be the c- category of personhood, at some level, an individual is going to be subjugated to another because they're going to be considered non-persons. Now, the question here, and then I'll end with this, is that nobody who has power or prestige is going to determine themselves to be non-persons. It's always to, the, to somebody who does not have the power or prestige or capital. They will be the ones that will be the ones considered to be non-persons unless they have an advocate for them or not. So there are these issues of, you know, political ideology to fall into this, but in our realm here in the medical moral ethics, what we have to come up with is, can we envision the categories of human life without considering them personhood? Or if we um, follow the idea of personhood having a nature, and that nature is consistent, and it has little to do with where it's at on um, whether it's level of potentiality or actuality, then we cannot envision any human life that is not a person. Those things always three go together. So this is just stuff for you to kind of mull over and think about. Um, What we'll do in the next class then is we will look very closely at uh, varying uh, interpretations of personhood and personality, um, you know, uh, criteria just to help us in our own ethical evaluations.